you geeks! On this week, which is different from all other weeks, I shall endeavor to explain how Tolkien's world building is substantially Catholic. Not just the little things like characters embodying Christian virtues, but the question that drives the whole plot. How can destroying the ring kill a minor deity? And more importantly, why does this not rip a hole in the space-time continuum? First, we must consider Tolkien's deities, then Sauron specifically, the ring itself, and what it means for it to be destroyed. Let's start at the very beginning. In the Cimmerillion, which by the way pairs with Children of Eden, of which there are no good recordings, we meet the Valar. They are powers created by Ero Iluvatar, Tolkien's one true god. Tolkien translated Valar from Elvish as little g gods. These latter are, as we should say, angelic powers, whose function is to exercise delegated authority in their spheres of rule and government not creation, making, or remake. They are divine, that is, they were originally outside and existed before the making of the world. Tolkien's notion that lesser deities could exist outside of time and space, dwelling with the one capital G God, is how Catholics conceive of angels. Dante's Divine Comedy makes the idea of an angel's sphere of influence quite literal. Dante theorized that angels create planets by focusing their attention on a place which amasses imperial substance, that is, a fiery material. The planet is contingent on the angel, not the other way around. In contrast, Milton held that angelic bodies were made from imperial substance even in heaven. Tolkien consistently uses angel to mean the love and attention of the light to the moat, which is a person that is both with us and in heaven, finite but divine. This person, which is purely a creation of divine thought, has no body, or as Tolkien would say, they are not incarnate. To put it scientifically, angels have no atoms, no matter. And matter is stuff. Everything that you can touch is matter. But they exist. They are a divine substance, which, according to the Catholic school of thought, can exist without matter. There is no composition of matter and form in an angel, yet there is act and potentiality. Supposing that the form itself subsists without matter, there is nevertheless remaining the relation of the form to its very existence, the potentiality to act. This kind of composition is understood to be the angels. So Tolkien steps into fantasy when the Valar enter the world and are able to take on matter, atoms, flesh, bodies, sorta. They were thus in the world, but not of a kind whose essential nature is to be physically incarnate. They were self-incarnate if they wished, but their incarnate forms were more analogous to our clothes than to our bodies, except that they were more the expression of their desires, moods, wills, and functions. These incarnate angels are how Tolkien is able to bridge the gap between pagan mythology and Christian history. It is, of course, not acceptable as theology, but plausible as art, a reasonable impossibility. Tolkien based his world on these angels incarnate, which is what made it such a groundbreakingly reasonable fantasy. True, we don't see the High Valar in The Lord of the Rings, but the entire plot hinges on their fallen lesser kin. The Dark Lord Sauron. Tolkien summarizes Sauron's nature as a minor but still angelic spirit. 
he belonged to the race of intelligent beings that were made before the physical world, and were permitted to assist in their measure in the making of it. Thus Sauron could exist without a body, but could summon one and wear it like the Valar did. Sauron's body, his matter and form, was entirely accidental to his being. He did not need it to exist, but it was still real. It was a physical actuality in the physical world, and not a vision transferred from mind to mind. It took some time to build up. It was then destructible like other physical organisms. The fluidity of Sauron's body explains how easily Sauron became a werewolf to fight Huon in the Cimmerillion, yet the reality of his body explains how he could be defeated, since his flesh, though sheddable, could still feel pain. Sauron shifted shape from wolf to serpent and from monster to his own accustomed form. But he could not elude the grip of Huan without forsaking his body utterly. Ere his foul spirit left its dark house, Luthien came to him and said he should be stripped of his raiment of flesh and his ghost be sent back to Morgoth. In the Catholic imagination, only those whose substance is not bound to their flesh may change shape of their own volition. Catholicism has long held that human souls and their bodies are inextricably united, which has always been a contentious claim, but we're not here to fight about that. Rather, we're here to discuss a smaller matter. Such a little thing. Tolkien warns his readers not to take the ring too seriously. You cannot press the one ring too hard, for it is, of course, a mythical feature, even though the world of tales is conceived in more or less historical terms. But isn't that what I do on this channel? Press things too hard and see what comes out? If Sauron could obtain any form at will, then why did he make the one ring? Could he not just materialize as metals? Metal, for the classics, were generally thought to be elementary. Though Dante refers to angels as alloys to poetically convey their unchanging nature. The ring, however, is intelligent and animated. He's abandoned, Gollum. Thus, its existence is another fantastic, reasonable impossibility. Intelligent metal. Though Tolkien makes it very clear that even in his fantasy realm, it is unnatural. The Valar may incarnate and create flesh, but only of living things. Yavanna goes so far as to incarnate as a tree, yet we do not see Tolkien's Valar materializing as something inanimate. I think this follows both from Tolkien's love of nature and his use of Norse myth. Even the great shapeshifter Loki always changed into something animate. Are you ever not going to fall for that? Because the ring is something unnatural, Sauron did not truly make the One Ring. Not as Eru or even the Valar made the world. The shadow that bred them can only mock. It cannot make not real new things of its own. Considering we first chronologically meet Sauron as a werewolf, I hardly think it is a coincidence that Augustine said something quite similar when discussing werewolves. Demons do not create real substances, but only change the appearance of things created by the true God, so as to make them seem to be what they are not. As established, Tolkien's fantasy comes from the Valar and Maiar being able to take on material bodies more real than just illusion. Sauron's unnatural act was artificing his material into inanimate metal. The ring is something artificial in that it bears a part of Sauron's soul separate from his natural form. Into this ring, he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. While he wore it, his power on Earth was actually enhanced. But even if he did not wear it, that power existed and was in rapport with himself. 
he was not diminished. This is a newish twist on an old myth, which Tolkien uses to its natural, tragic conclusion of such a power trip. The Ring of Sauron is only one of the various mythical treatments of the placing of one's life or power in some external object, which is thus exposed to capture or destruction with disastrous results to oneself. Destroy it! The weakness of Sauron's ring is that he could lose it, though Sauron, being obsessed with gaining power, assumed that if it was found, the new possessor could, if sufficiently strong and heroic by nature, challenge Sauron, become master of all that he had learned or done since the making of the One Ring, and so overthrow him and usurp his place. Hence why Boromir's idea was shot down at Rivendell. Give Gondor the weapon of the enemy. Let us use it against him. Rather, Elrond proposed another option. The ring must be destroyed. It is quite similar to what Tenuviel and Huon achieved back in the Cimmerillion, stripping Sauron of his physical form and achieving momentary victory. For Sauron was always debodied when vanquished. But of course, this did not destroy the spirit, nor dismiss it from the world to which it was bound until the end. The difference in the Third Age, besides it taking nine men to achieve what one woman could do, is that Sauron, having unnaturally split a portion of his power from his person and forging it into the form of metal, became bound to the rules of physics. Once it was forged into this world, it can be unmade without breaking the world. Though, of course, from physics, we know that every action has a reaction. But this is not the power of the Valar splitting open the universe and shoving Morgoth out. Rather, this is just dreadfully inconvenient to Sauron, depriving him of his natural ability to incarnate for the foreseeable future. That Sauron was not himself destroyed in anger of the One is not my fault. The problem of evil is a permanent one for all who concern themselves with our world. The indestructibility of spirits with free wills, even by the creator of them, is also an inevitable feature if one either believes in their existence or feigns it in a story. Tolkien is, of course, one that believes in divine, indestructible spirits. This belief is quintessential to the Catholic worldview, since Catholics are called to view the world through the lens of the Eucharist, and Tolkien is one such Catholic who answered this call. I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the Blessed Sacrament. There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves upon earth. And more than that, death. By the divine paradox, that which ends life and demands the surrender of all. In the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, Catholics believe that the substance of bread and wine are changed into the substance of the body of Christ, the one true God who, unlike angels, can truly incarnate as a man, so why not as bread and wine? Even though the matter, the atoms, the grain, the flavor, and yes, the alcohol content all remain the same, usually. There are exceptions. The Eucharist is not like Sauron, who divided himself to fit into a ring. Rather, each host contains the whole body of Christ, which we then eat and shockingly do not explode, usually. It is with this Eucharistic worldview that Tolkien can say, yes, let's go destroy the physical manifestation of evil today and not have to worry about blowing a hole in the space-time continuum. The more I read fantasy, the more I realize how few authors use this rule. Either they make their Dark Lords less powerful or make the fallout of their destruction more dramatic. This video began brewing for me last year when I spent far too long thinking about how to annihilate Odium, a lesser god in Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive series. 
I had figured out a way to annihilate the divine material of Odium's shard or investiture. And then something struck me. I was proposing the equivalent of nuking a planet's worth of divine material and expected only minimal physical repercussions. The band-aid answer I came up with at the time was, well, Tolkien did it. I now see that Sanderson and Jordan both use a more Miltonian conception of divine substance, which makes their tales that much more incredible for me, though not inconceivable. At the very least, they make Tolkien's Middle Earth stand out as substantially Catholic. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.